Okay, so this is the last lecture in this course, and we're going to talk about the Internet of Things. So, start with a little introduction. So this term coined by Kevin Aston in 1999. The idea that is that you have a, a network of physical objects, devices, buildings, vehicles, and so on. These devices all have electronics embedded in them, as well as some form of wireless or wired communication. And so these devices can all collect and exchange data with each other. And so we can sense and control objects remotely from the internet, leading to all these you know, catchy terms such as smart grids, smart homes, intelligent transportation, smart cities, and so on and so forth. So it's a sort of super trendy emergent field, and lots of companies are kind of scrambling to kind of get a, get a piece of the pie, essentially. So, you know, a few years ago, you know, this might have been the, the vision of the home of the future, that you have some, a single super intelligent robot um, that, you know, hoovered the floor, put the, cooked the dinner, you know, brought you a beer and, you know, and some crisps when you felt a little bit thirsty. Um, but this, you know, this vision is sort of slowly dying, I think. Um, uh, I used to be quite heavily involved in the European robotics community, and I um, saw so lots and lots of projects, you know, funded by, by Europe on building humanoid robot, humanoid type robots with just a robot arm that could, like, you know, make a cup of coffee or, uh, you know, maybe make a pancakes. And there was, a lot of these systems were very brittle. They didn't have any deep understanding. And, you know, if it flipped the pancake and the pancake stuck to the ceiling, it would just continue making the, you know, continue pretending as if nothing had happened. So it might be good, you know, for, from the point of view of keeping up appearances, but it's not very good if you actually want to eat the pancake and it's stuck to the ceiling and the robot hasn't made another one. It's just brought you an empty plate. So personally, I can't see this uh, humanoid robot uh, bringing the beer happening anytime soon. Well, they might be able to bring beer now, but they're quite a long way off uh, the intelligence that's required to, uh, you know, uh, notice whether, the, well, you know, do a full full understanding of what's going on in the scene and responding to it and doing lots of other tasks. So you can do very specialized things. So those early Honda robots could play the trumpet beautifully, but you know, uh, if they fell over, then they were stuffed. So we're a long way from this. And, and more importantly, it was probably the wrong kind of vision anyway, because this is much more realistic vision of how the hope of the future will look. Instead of one super smart robot that'll shuffle around, polishing the car, you know, switching the TV on off for you, um, you know, configuring, you know, this and that, making the breakfast. What we're more like, much more likely to have is a home that's embedded with lots and lots of different bits of smart electronics um, that are doing a, a simple, well, or, or, or relatively complicated task, but a very well-defined task within a specific context. So, you know, back in, back in the day, we thought we'd have intelligent, we'd have like this humanoid robot that would wash the dishes, right? But now we've got dishwasher. So we don't really have such a need for this smart robot who can like, you know, work with like water and scrubbing brushes and all the rest of it. So the idea of the future, a much more realistic vision of the future, is that as much as possible of our home, you know, the toaster, the washing machine, dishwasher, the cooker, the car, uh, you know, maybe the children, you know, they've all got embedded electronics um, so that it can sense and, and these embedded electronics enable these devices to be controlled and manipulated you know, over the internet, and these devices can all talk to each other, they can all learn our habits and do the sorts of things we want and, and therefore minimize the amount of effort we've got to go to in our future home. So I'll just run through a few sort of little examples of Internet of Things just to get the whole thing started. So, for example, we've got uh, biochips in animals, so you can turn yourself into an internet-enabled thing um, by implanting a chip into yourself. So these guys, like biohackers, have kind of put this chip inside their hands like that. And this guy, Kevin Warwick at Reading, you know, is one of the pioneers of this. He had a uh, sort of chip in his arm, I think, and used it to open doors and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's more seriously, it's used uh, in, like, animals. Um, so you might want to track the weight of particular animals, give different animals different feeds, kind of control the access of animals to different parts. And you can sort of almost imagine a cattle farm that's almost entirely automated, right? That, each cow is being tracked and monitored individually, and its access to feeds monitored, and then it's the milking pens can now be automated as well. So the farmer can just, you know, go to the Caribbean, relax, and then just, you know, watch the money flow into his account. So yeah, monitoring, controlling food, weight and health, enable disable access. And I said, people, you know, whether this will be the the the, the future of uh, in in terms of humans is is a little bit more open to question. I think maybe a slightly darker world, you know. 
Then we have health monitoring, so people do monitor themselves, just not necessarily with uh, chips inside them. Um, so we have using already using smart devices inside and outside our bodies to, for home diagnosis, communication with clinicians. So you know, you've got the Fitbit, never tried it, but I think you know monitors how much activity you're doing, this kind of stuff. Um, a more interesting example, another company I applied for, for a job with last year and didn't get, um, which is Alstone Gas and Chemical Detection. So they've got a chip that's very good at uh, s smelling the sort of small quantities of different kinds of chemicals in, in, in the air. So in some of their early experiments, they've shown that they can detect um, early signs uh, whether a person does or does not have cancer just by analyzing the uh, chemical constituents in their breath using their chip. So, you know, in the medium to long term, these guys might be able to add a chip to your smartphone that will both give it a nose, but also enable it to detect whether you've got signs of cancer at the moment. So if you've got uh, more smart electronics, electronics embedded in you, you can notice radical changes in your behavior um, or changes in your chemical composition in your breath or changes in, uh, you know, blood flow, heart rate, all this kind of stuff. And if you bung that all into machine learning algorithms, you can probably do some, you know, some nice early diagnosis. So as I'm sure you're aware, you've got a much better chance of recovering from cancer or heart disease or this kind of stuff if you're picking these conditions up early and then you can uh, have the appropriate treatment or change your lifestyle in order to avoid these problems or diabetes being another example. So by having all these smart devices, both in your home and your smartphone, um, you can then um, detect diseases early, potentially treat them more effectively. And also, if you're undergoing treatment, then you can have this constant monitoring process on, and then you can potentially you know, communicate with clinicians automatically. They can view all the data, and they can do some analysis on it. That's a, you know, the, the hospital of the future kind of stuff. And you can even use cameras, uh, you know, as I said, the gas monitors developed by Alstom. Then we have smart cars. I'm sure you've heard of you know, Google cars doing having a million miles. You've probably also heard of the recent crash uh, I think it was Tesla, was it? Uh, you know, something went wrong. Either the person who was sitting in the driving seat controlled the car or the, there weren't, weren't, weren't uh, adequate sensors in the car, so it just turned out in a motorway lane and, you know, the guy, got, the guy was killed. Um, so uh, we already have self-driving cars. I mean, there's a lot of debate about the legal issues, about whether, you know, who's responsible, who's liable. Is it the person who wrote the software? Is it the person in the car? But I guess my view is that um, if human humans are pretty bad at driving cars, right? We're getting 3,000 people dying a year in Britain, roughly. Uh, that's a lot of people dying. And so if, smart car if a self-driving cars only killed 1,500, then, the, then, the then Britain would be greatly improved. So um, it's not a question about whether people would die in self-driving cars. It's a question about whether self-driving cars are better than people. And a lot of people are pretty lousy drivers. So, um, so that, all that stuff's already out there. And then the next step beyond the self-driving car will be things like vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure connections. So um, in a motorway, you've got all these cars like nicely spaced because of the braking distances and because the person, in one, as you're driving a car, you've no idea what the person ahead of you is going to do, right? So you need to leave a bit of space because um, you don't know their intentions. Whereas if, if the cars are communicating with each other and all of the cars know exactly what they're going to do at a particular point in time, then they can go much closer together and you get something like a train of cars, or you know, cars lined up, you know, sort of like train carriages, uh, moving down the motorway in a much more efficient manner. And then the cars will know whether the car in the middle needs to turn off and then they can automatically create space for that and the car can turn off. So it'll be vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure connections, so they can have like routing of cars automatically combined with the self-driving technology. In the EU, all cars are going to be fitted with what's called an e-call equipped chip um, that will automatically contact the nearest emergency center in the case of collision. So you, you hit a lamppost, car stops, the air airbags inflate, and then this chip will call the emergency services automatically. So even if you're unconscious, they can reach you, you know, much sooner than they would if, if, if it relied on someone else calling the ambulance services and so on. Then we have smart TVs. So, you know, we've got a smart TV at home. It's basically a TV that's connected to the internet and gives video streaming games. There's something like a Raspberry Pi type computer inside it that does all that. Um, uh, so it's sort of smart-ish. Um, but in the future, you know, maybe they could monitor your viewing activity. They could like pause the ads when you walk out the room so that you're forced to watch them. Uh, cameras that are tracking your eyes, seeing how, you know, monitoring your behavior. 
you know, targeting ads depending on the demographic profile of people in the room, whether it's old people, you have ads for, you know, saga holidays, whatever, it's young people, you have ads for Ibiza holidays, this kind of stuff, uh, all, all signed up for and agreed to by the people participating in exchange for a cheaper TV or something. Um, so all kinds of ways in which the TV could, you know, invade your privacy of your home. And then another direction they could go is that the TV could be like the interface for the smart devices in the home. So, you know, you could have like a little talking face um, that, you know, can, you can say home, you know, bring me, some, you know, switch on the heating, please, or something. And then that would talk to the thermostat and switch the heating on kind of thing. So at the moment, you've got Amazon Echo, which aspires to be this kind of device. But Echo doesn't have a face. It's just this faceless black column thing. So if you had a TV that you had a little smiley face on it, maybe it'd be a better way to interface with, it, with all the other smart devices in the home. Then we've got smart alarms. So um, these are devices that, you know, maybe they monitor your patterns of activity in the home so they can tell by listening and by looking, you know, whether people are around and whether they recognize that pe those people using face recognition, voice recognition. And you could, you know, incorporate lots of different sensors into, the, into these kind of systems. Um, and use, you know, use the chip in your arm to disarm or face recognition. And so this is the sort of, one of these sort of devices may well have been, this may have closed by the time I've given this talk, but uh, it's basically uh, trying to raise some cash for this kind of uh, smart alarm thing. It's got an HD camera and probably microphones and maybe movement sensors as well. So you stick it in your home, it learns your patterns, and then it will alert you when those patterns deviate from normal uh, using the phone or something like that. So it's learning your home's rhythms and sending you smarter alerts. So things like sudden temperature changes, sound, movement, and so on. So it's probably really annoying to start with, right? It'll constantly send alarms when you go into the bathroom, but then over time it'll learn that you know, maybe this isn't such a good idea and you can probably adjust its level of, uh, level of sensitivity as well. Then we've got smart clothes. Uh, you know, maybe clothes that reflect your mood. So when you're feeling you know, super hot, you know, it's, it should, they go red or something. When you're feeling a bit down, they go kind of blue. Uh, you know, they can change the thermal properties maybe in response to changes in the environment. Um, water resistance, so on and so forth. I think these probably tracking activity and stuff, these IOFIT trainers. Now, smart light bulbs. So smart light bulbs, you know, pretty much everyone, you know, and their dog seems to have developed some kind of smart light bulb because it's sort of the simplest thing to do. Possibly not the most useful thing to do, but it's uh, fairly simple and you can see, see when it's working. And so if you've got a smart light bulb, you can uh, change the lighting depending on the person. So maybe, you know, Uncle Ted, you know, likes nice soft lighting. Or Auntie Mary, you know, likes really hard lighting so she can do the knitting or whatever. Different activities. So if you're watching an action film, maybe you want the lights to flash dramatically in a dramatic scenes. Or if it's a rom-com, you want like soft lighting, slowly shifting patterns kind of stuff. You might want to change the lighting depending on the fire. So if there's a fire in the night, you want to switch all the lights on so that people can escape. And as I said, there's lots of smart bulbs out there. So initially, I thought, hey, you know, as my example, which I'm going to come to later, let's do a, let's do a smart light bulb. But then, you know, the infrastructure, you know, I'd have to buy the bulb, which is quite expensive, and then buy the hub. That's about getting it all working. So in the end, I decided to do something else. But, you know, it's, it's very easy to to get these kind of things working, you've got 100 quid spare, and some of them have developer kits. Then we have smart appliances. So Nest, I'm going to talk about in more detail later. One of the companies leading this, and they've got this sort of smart thermostat, which is becoming, you know, they're sort of market leaders in this stuff, and technology leaders, and they're also, um, and this is kind of their, their hub, but it's also a thermostat. And you can imagine, maybe you want a freezer that tells you when, when the temperature's too high. Intelligence, this is the intelligent central heating control. Got the crock pot that lets you take control from your phone. So I suppose in the morning, you'd sort of put all your ingredients in it because it doesn't, doesn't cook the food, right? You've got to fill it with stuff. So you can put stuff in there. And then when you're at work, you find you've got this is super important meeting. So you decide you're going to be home late. So then you configure your crock pot from the internet and tell it to start cooking you know, a bit later. That would be the kind of idea where you can monitor its process, progress and so on and so forth. We even have intelligent cat feeders now, you know, all part of the, the glories of modern civilization. So these can kind of recognize your cat's face. So if you've got other cats coming through your cat flap into your home, well, those other cats, you know, have got to do, you know, they're not going to be recognized, so they won't get any food. You can look at your cat um, having, its, having its dinner. Um, so if you're sitting on the beach relaxing, you know, you probably want to fish out your phone and check that your cat's having a nice feed. 
Um, it tracks its appetite and weight and so on and so forth if you wanted to. So again, another project that may well have been funded, so you may be able to buy one of these uh, soon. And the military has spent uh, vast amounts of cash on the Internet of Things in recent years because obviously you want to minimize the um, number of soldiers in the line of fire and minimize costs. Because, um, you know, for example, drones, I'm sure you've heard lots about, you know, you can build a much more efficient drone um, if you don't have a person in it because the person takes up space, takes up weight. You've got to have, like, oxygen if you're flying high and all this kind of stuff. And your limits on the Gs that a, that a person can take, I mean, because they just pass out if you're going banking too sharply. Whereas a drone has none of these limitations and you're not spending millions of, you're spending a lot of money to train the pilots, but all your pilots are just sitting in Utah or somewhere just twiddling away the controls. So you're not putting any pilots at risk um, in the line of fire kind of thing. So, you know, drones have been a very popular technology. And you've got things like remote control machine guns. So these are, you know, the soldier sits behind, you know, somewhere behind the battlefield and drives these things in with a laptop and then can control the fire remotely. And there's a lot of controversy about... Uh, uh, you know, robots. There was like a campaign a few years ago, like, you know, ban killer robots was the rather, you know, hysterical title of it. Um, my own view is, you know, it, it should be an evidence-driven thing. I mean, soldiers, you know, can go wrong, if you like. They can kill civilians. They can commit acts of brutality. Um, so soldiers aren't perfect either. So the question is whether a robotic system can... If you've got to do, I mean, I'm not in general in favor of the whole killing business, but if, you, if you're an army and you have to do some killing, well, you want to do it as accurately as possible. And if this kind of system, if it was like automatic targeting of the enemy could be done in a way that minimized civilian casualties and did a better job than soldiers, then surely it's better to have, um, you know, these kind of systems. I mean, the, the problems will come when the com countries decided that decided to minimize their casualties without really caring about minimizing targeting civilian casualties. But if the aim of the system is to minimize civilian you know, casualties, then maybe it'd be better to have robots controlling the firing than soldiers controlling the firing. And there's also other issues that if, if soldiers are controlling things with a laptop, there's like a bit of a dissociation between the soldier and the person they're killing. And it becomes a bit too much like a computer game, so there's other problems with this. And again, maybe more of an argument for automated targeting. Okay, and then we have, you know, uh, the Texans um, with their, you know, love of guns. So this chap, uh, this is another Internet of Things example. So this chap uh, bought a load of deer, stuck them on his ranch, and built this rifle um, with like a, and you basically you could pay to control this rifle and shoot the deer remotely on his ranch. Um, no doubt there's other type systems. I mean, this one I think got shut down, but I think there's other kind of systems out there. So if you love shooting deer but can't be bothered to get out there and actually shoot the deer, you shoot the deer in person, then you can just you know sit at home, twiddle away, and probably you know cause some horrible damage to deer without actually killing them. So anyway, yes, lots of you know good and bad as any technology. Uh, any technology is it's good and bad, and the Internet as, of Things has plenty of good and bad. So I gave you some examples uh, of uh, like the canary. Smart alarm, um, it's learning patterns of activity and adapting to your habits, and Nest does this as well. Um, so I said the dream, you know, I don't know if you know, the, sort of the idea originally behind, you know, the smart home was this sort of clunky robot that walks around and you say, you know, do the washing, please, Alfred, or whatever its name is, and off it goes and it does, does the washing. But that's kind of a pain because you, you, then you still have to do all the memory stuff about telling it to do this, telling it to do that. You know, it's, it's a lot of effort, right? So the idea of this smart home in the future is that it'll learn what you want to do and do it before you actually know that you want to do it kind of thing. It'll predict what you want and do it before you have to actually make an effort to do it. So it'll know, let's suppose, take the beer example, that when you sit in front of the game, uh, you know, and at a, when it's showing the basketball or whatever game you watch, um, that you like to drink a beer. So it'll automatically ensure that there's beers in the fridge. It'll know the TV schedules, it'll know, and so it'll stock your fridge with beer prior to basketball games um, so that you um, are automatically ordering them from Tesco's or whatever. So your fridge will be nicely stocked with cold beers and maybe it'll bring the beer to you if you're very lucky. So it's carrying out tasks before you know that you want them done. And so dynamically adapting to your habits, learning your habits, and doing what you want before you know that you want it. And this is where Apache Spark or Apache Storm come because they're streaming all this stuff 
from your home, processing it, and then causing things to be done based upon those patterns of data. Now, the, one of the big issues with the Internet of Things is security and reliability. So security is often weak on these smart devices. You know, these poor engineers, you know, they're slogging away, getting all these chips working, getting all these actuators working. It's, it's, it's a hard graph getting all this stuff working. Imagine the automated cat feeder, how many drafts we went through, how many cats died, you know, in this feeder. You know, it must, must have been a lot of work. So at the end, of, and then they've got the management leaning on them. So they're just exhausted when they finally got the thing working. And they really don't necessarily focus on the security in the way that they should. So they focus typically on the getting the thing done, getting it working, getting it out according to a time, scale, time schedule set by the management. And security is often an afterthought that may or may not be added to the device. And if the security is weak, then hackers can access the data and control the devices remotely. This is all about devices talking to each other over the internet, but then that allows people with bad intentions to, do the, to access these devices as well, unless they're correctly secured. So I gave you an example in the security talk on, uh, of cars that could be shut down you know, remotely. Like put, you could apply the brakes or cut the engine on a car just, just by communicating wirelessly with it, if you could hack into it, by hacking into it effectively. I'll give you a little bit of example of a few other examples now. So a lot of commercial vehicles have this, what's called a telematics gateway unit. Um, these are connected to the internet a lot of the time, a lot, a lot of the time. and so, and they've got security weaknesses in them, so you can read the data from them and potentially change some of the parameters. So how serious in terms of changing the vehicle's behavior is, I don't know. You could probably, maybe you could reroute the vehicles or something like that. Then the Fitbit had some kind of vulnerability, so you could place data on it and retrieve the data from it. It was a little bit controversial whether you could actually infect computers by infecting a uh, Fitbit. This rather dark example of baby alarms, so they had some vulnerability. So people were hacking into them and shouting obscenities at children. It's rather unpleasant. And then you've got the reliability issues on top of that. So it's all very well if your, you know, uh, your web processing program falls over and dies. Well, you haven't lost much. You've just got to restart it up again. But in this case, reliability issues affect the real physical world as well as you know, just the software and the inconvenience. So if your car's software fails and you crash, and, and you crash then that's a serious... Uh, that's a serious error, that's a serious issue caused by a software failure, not just by a hardware failure. What if the software on your connected device fails and burns your house down? What if Nest just goes crazy and runs your heating into overdrive you know, and kills, kills your pets, for example, or something like that? So there have been reliability issues with software in cars, for example. I remember, was it Toyota or someone? You know, it was like doing weird braking things. So, so there's lots of reliability issues you need to think about as well as security issues. All right. So I've set up a little bit about the Internet of Things, what's going on there, um, and possibly where it's going. Now I'm going to talk, a, talk about some of the network side of that, like how you connect to things, how, things are, how you can control things remotely. And then I'm going to make it all concrete with a home server example, uh, something to do at home. Um, so I'll show you how you can uh, configure a home router so you can run a server at home, and then show you how to write uh, a little like, simple web page that lets you switch an LED on and off at home and um, monitor the temperature and light levels in your home. So this is obviously a very simplified example, but you know, once you can switch an LED on and off, then you can switch a motor on and off, you can do all kinds of things. So this is a, a, a simple framework that will enable you to do all kinds of different things and all kinds of different home automation if, if you're inclined towards that. Okay, so firstly we're going to talk about uh, connecting to things. So the Internet of Things, clues in the name right, the Internet of Things, is all about connections between things and connections between things and the internet. So in this section, I'm going to focus on uh, protocols and technology developed by Nest. So there's lots of stuff out there, lots of different companies competing for space with competing protocols and all the rest of it. But I'm going to pick Nest um, because they, they do some very nice uh, things, right? Their thermostats so are super slick, very popular. They've got their smart smoke alarm as well. And no doubt they'll bring out other products. So, and they've, Nest have also done a lot of serious, hard technological work on designing protocols, designing, developing ways in which the things can talk to each other in a power efficient way and then ways in which things can communicate um, with the internet and with phones and all the rest of it. And they, they were bought by Google a few years ago and you can completely see why. So I think Nest is a very good example of nice internet of things, protocols and communication and probably it'll end up being open standards and other people use it as well. So there's the sort of developer page of Nest. So there's several 
layers to all of this. The first sort of bottom layer is um, the sort of communication between devices within the home. So the problem is you can't use Wi-Fi for this because Wi-Fi is quite high power. And what you want is a, a way in which small devices like sensors on doors, uh, you know, I think some other examples, uh, these uh, infrared movement detector type things, uh, your washing machine, your TV, whatever, lots of small things that aren't necessarily connected to mains power uh, need to be able to talk to each other in a power efficient way. So they don't like, Wi-Fi is going to take too much power, so you need something a lot lower power and, and simpler, but also reliable as well. And so what Nestor developed is Thread, and this is like a self-healing mesh network. So it's a bit like uh, the internet and internet protocols that enables the different devices within the home to connect together. Um, it's encrypted for security, because security is obviously a big issue. You might have a, a smart door lock as part of this Thread network, and so you don't want someone to be able to sniff Sniff, sniff the communications to it and, um, and hack into it and send packets to it to open the door. So it's a nice protocol and apparently devices can have years of operation on a single AA battery. So, I mean, there's other competitors to this, but this seems pretty nice. So things like ZigWave, ZigBee, Wemo, but Nest Thread sort of is a more modern sort of alternative to this, um, which, which I, as I said, I imagine works pretty well. There's an article on the class website comparing all the differences between all of these. Key being, of course, works well for Nest, but whether, whether you can use it depends on how, how open this is. And then we've got Weave, and this is a bit like, uh, say, HTTP or something, I think, working on top of the internet protocol. So it's something like using a, it's like, you remember all that encapsulation and layer stuff? Well, Weave is an application layer protocol that sits on top of Thread. So it enables you to send messages between devices in the home with low latency, so 100 milliseconds, pretty good. And it's got security layers with different zones, so if I hack into the light bulb, I can't open the door, that kind of stuff. Um, and again, there's the documentation there. I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail here, um, but that gives you an idea about how you talk about, how the devices talk within the home, you're using combination uh, thread and weave. But they also need to be able to access the internet. There's no, not much, it's all very nice devices talking within a home. So at home, I've got like a, some kind of Yale security system and you've got the door sensors and the sort of movement detectors all talking to, and the smoke detector all talking to each other within the home. But you need these devices to also talk to the internet so I can monitor, so, so it can tell me when someone's broken into the home and I can configure, the, and I can reset the alarm or do all this kind of stuff. So Thread and Weave are low, local, low power, communication within a single home, but we also need to reach the internet. And the typical way in which this is done is some kind of hub. So it's going to have a more powerful computer that can talk over Wi-Fi or over the internet or over the ethernet and maybe has more batteries in it or is connected to the mains. So home hubs, like a small computer, so it's using thread and weave to talk to all the devices in the home. It's picking up the data from them, sending them off to the internet, to, to someone's smartphone or whatever, and then enables, and, the, and then the person's smartphone is talking to this hub and, in, and using that communication to, you know, change the settings on the thermostat, open the door, uh, talk to, you know, different, different devices in the home. With Nest, they've sort of wrapped it all up in the thermostat for whatever reason, um, but there's many other options out there. So, as I said, lots and lots of people are spending time and money trying to get into this market. So, this is the, which one's that? So that's the Philips Home Hub. I said Nest have wrapped it up in the thermostat. They may change that later. You've got Wemo, I think it's a Belkin one. And then you've got Amazon Echo, I think, can communicate with different devices in the home. And then one of these is Samsung, and I think one of these is Apple as well. So there's like a proliferation of different hubs. And, you know, they're not that cheap. So this one's about 50 quid. So this is why I decided against the, the smart light bulb idea. So um, how does the hub talk to the rest of the internet? That's the question. So it's got all this information and needs to receive, send and receive information with your smartphone, which is running on a different network. So one method is to run a server on the hub so that other devices, such as my smartphone or a web browser or whatever, can direct, can communicate with that server just in the same way they communicate with a standard HTTP server, and they can set and get things on that server and so on and so forth. And that, that'd be one model. So in this model, I'm including the router here because as I'll explain later, this is a rather crucial part of the thing which messes everything up a little bit. But one way, one way this could work is we have a server here, same way I've shown you how to build servers in lots of different ways in this course. You could build a server there, the server talks to the smoke alarm, the thermostat, and the security camera, and on my smartphone I can talk to that server, I can pull images from the security camera, and I can set the temperature and so on in the, in the, smart, in the thermostat. 
So that's one way this could work. So it's easy to implement. It's cheap. Um, you don't pay for web hosting. And I'm going to give you an example, you know, because it sort of makes sense in the context of this course to, to give this as an example, as I'm going to give this example later in the course, later in this lecture, sorry. So it's, it's, it's dead easy to make work. And after I designed this course, I did my home security system, and I built it using exactly this architecture, because it's dead easy to use, dead easy to, easy to write the server, and it's easy for the server to pull data from the security camera. So then I can, I wrote a simple server, ran it on a Raspberry Pi, and pull, pull the data from the Pi camera, and then I could just give me this remote monitoring thing I wanted. But the trouble is, you've got to mess around configuring the router, and I'm going to talk about how you do that. It's not, it takes a bit of time and effort. You might have to pay for dynamic DNS, as I explained, the IP address of the router changes. You've got to handle that somehow. You've got to pay for the electricity. You've got to have a computer that's on all the time. If that's your desktop, you're at risk from, of having your home computer hacked from the internet or having your devices hacked remotely. So when I did my home security thing, I put a bit of time and effort into ensuring, well, hoping, doing the best that I could in the time available to ensure that other people couldn't like, see me sitting on the couch, you know, eating my popcorn or whatever, uh, maybe in my underwear, who knows. So you need to take great care um, with security if you're running a home server in this way. The way that Nest does this, and, I, and I, if I was building a commercial system, this is how I'd build it, um, is using cloud communication. So instead of having a server in the hub, what you have is a client in the hub, and the hub sends sensor data to the cloud and pulls control data from the cloud. And other devices, such as phones, web browsers, and so on, view and set data in the cloud. So this is the model here. And this model, I've, we don't really need the router because the router it just functions as a, it just root stuff. We don't have to make incoming connections. We're only making outcoming connections. So we can scrub the router in this case. Don't have to worry about it. And so in this case, we've got a data structure in the cloud. The client modifies this data structure with information from these devices, and this and the web browser or the phone change this data structure, and then the client reads these changes and makes appropriate changes in the devices. That's the model of cloud communication. So I'll run through a little example to make this as clear as I can. So suppose you've got a smart thermostat, and it's got two values. It's got current temperature, that's the temperature that the room is, the current temperature of the room that the thermostat's in, and target temperature is like what temperature the thermostat's aspiring to reach to the extent the thermostats can aspire. So, um, so suppose the room's 15, you might set the target temperature to 20 so that it's nice and warm and comfortable. Now these, in the cloud communication method, um, we're storing these two values in the cloud. And then the user's phone and the target temperature is set by the user. The user's saying, I want the room to be 20 degrees, I want the room to be 25 degrees, and so on. And so the user can use the phone or the web browser or whatever to set the target temperature in the cloud. And then thermostat client can pull that target temperature from the cloud and change its behavior based upon this target temperature. And the opposite happens with the current temperature. In this case, the thermostat clients regularly updating the state of current temperature in the cloud. And the phone is downloading the current temperature and displaying it to the user. So the user can see the current temperature as uploaded by the thermostat. And it can set the target temperature and control the thermostat's behavior. So here we have the cloud, and the cloud has these two values, target temperature and current temperature. And so the client is getting the target temperature and using that to turn the heating on and off. And it's setting the current temperature and, because it's measuring the temperature in the room and setting that temperature here in the cloud. And the opposite is happening with the, with the smartphone. It's setting the target temperature. The user wants it to be at 20 degrees, let's say, and it's getting the current temperature so that it can show on the user's control panel in the smartphone, it'll say current temperature, uh, 18, 15, let's say, target, you know, target temperature, uh, 20, let's say. So I think it's pretty clear. So the advantages are secure, a lot of work done uh, on security with cloud communication and so on. Um, and we talked about that with the Amazon example with the access key and the secret access key. So this, this work is done in terms of making it secure, with the, making secure, enabling secure communication between the client and the cloud. We don't have to do this laborious business of a dynamic DNS and home router configuration. Uh, and we can also use all this distributed data processing in the cloud to analyze the client's data for patterns and learn their behavior patterns, learn when they're in and out of the home, and switch the heating on and off accordingly. So these, the idea of this smart thermostat originally, I think, is partly to save the user money by only by learning when the user's typically at home and switching the heating, 
making the heating, making the house warm when the user's there, but not, but not bothering to heat it when they're not actually present. And it's suitable for commercial products because no commercial products can be based around messy hum home router configuration, and you need that home router configuration if you're running a server in the home hub. But you do have to faff around with the cloud storage, um, which can be a bit tricky, and it can be a bit more complicated to implement. So you know, it, it's the sort of thing you do if you're Nest, but it's not the sort of thing you do as a simple example, and that's why I haven't done it as a simple example. And Nest, you know, they've done the work on making the cloud thing sensible and clean. Um, so what they have is a JSON document stored in the cloud that holds the sensor and the control data for the devices in the home. And then the hub communicates with the cloud to update the sensor data and access the settings. So there's all this stuff about how it works. So here's a pretty picture of Nest. So all these devices are talking to the cloud where they've got this big JSON document. And this is the sort of data model, so it's an elaborate model of all the different parameters of all the different devices and all their current status and states or whatever. And then using the, the Nest sort of interface, the API, you can sort of view and set different parts of this data model. And then the other bits, other clients and other devices can then view and set that different parts of the data model as well. So it's a very nice way in which, which it all works. So to talk to the cloud, we've got different ways. So you've got the standard HTTP methods, which is like the not recommended, the sort of fallback method when nothing else works. So you can do get, post, put, delete, but then you've got to run those uh, HTTP requests like every second or quite often, so there's a big overhead both on the home hub side and, both, and on the server side, so this isn't ideal. Then we've got REST streaming, there's some way in which you can stream all the device, all the settings to and from the, um, to and from the hub, between the hub and the cloud, I'm not quite sure how that works. And then you've got Firebase, this is I think is their mainstream method for doing all this stuff, where you've got the real-time data synchronization based on WebSockets. So it's still based on the HTTP, but it's, and it's still using the same ports as HTTP, and so it'll go nice, easy, two-way communication between the client and the server in a way that the server can push stuff, but without the problem of the, um, without the router getting in the way and having all these kinds of problems. So, so Firebase is the way, that, you know, the way that they prefer, I think, and as I said, we had the talk on WebSockets earlier in this term. So yes, WebSockets, TCP-based protocol, it's bi-directional because You've got, you, you need, you've, when the user sets the target temperature, you need to, a way in which that can be pushed to the home hub so it can be set immediately in the home. And so you need the bi-directional data transfer and so either you have to make lots of HTTP requests, you have to use long polling, or you can use WebSockets, which is a much nicer way of doing this. So the server can, once the connection's established, the server can send data to the client without the client requesting it. It's working over standard ports, supported by browsers, and you can also get, as I explained in the talk on WebSockets, there's lots of libraries supporting this as well. So one of the issues raised by the Internet of Things, apart from security and reliability, is that there's lots of different standards. Everyone is fighting to gain their slice of the, of the market. And so you might say one person's, if you buy all of your devices from Nest, then you're probably okay, or all of your devices from Philips, they'll probably talk to each other and work okay. But if you've got like a Philips light bulb, a Nest thermostat, and a, a Belkin cook pot, cook crock pot, or whatever it's called, and a cat feeder made by someone else, chances are you're gonna have to use like a different app for each different device, and it's even worse if you've got like different light bulbs made by different people. What a nightmare. And this is discussed in some of the articles on the course website. So this company is trying to address this nightmare to some extent by having um, what's called if, they, if this then that. It's like a, a way in which this company has gone to the trouble of interfacing with these different um, devices made by different manufacturers, and you can create rules that link these different devices together. So if, you know, uh, it's dark, you switch the light on, if, uh, if my laundry basket weighs more than three kilos, well, no, that wouldn't really work because you would to get it into the washing machine. But anyway, the, lots of conditional commands that can link together the different internet-enabled things. Um, so that's the idea behind this. How effective it is, I, I couldn't say because I haven't tried it. Another attempt to address this issue has been the Open Connectivity Foundation. So it's basically uh, sort of these various companies who are important in this area not all of them that are important necessarily, kind of get together regularly and try and agree on common standards uh, for Internet of Things to talk to each other so that they can all interoperate and all be controlled by a single app. That's the idea. Okay, so that's the overview, introduction, protocols. That's all the high-level stuff. So now I thought I'd give you a nice concrete example to explain how you, can do, how you can do this at home or in your projects or whatever. So I'm going to demonstrate it with a simple example. So you have the whole chain of command going from the web browser to the server to the actual thing 
in both directions. So I'm going to show you how you can build a home server and web page that displays the temperature and light levels and enables you to switch the LED on and off. It does require a messy home router configuration because they're not commu communicating through the cloud, but on the other hand, it's sort of a cheap and easy way of doing it, um, which you know, is, is more realistic as a sort of starting project, I think. It's probably not secure. I haven't put any effort into security, so probably not secure. It is not secure. Um, and if you wanted to, it wouldn't be too, too much work to write it as a client that communicates with the cloud using WebSockets, but you still have to do all the security stuff with that. But you probably have to do that anyway to communicate with the cloud, so that might be a better way to do it. So the components of this are, we've got a web page written in HTML and JavaScript, then we've got server software written in Java using the Java HTTP server that I covered in the media streaming talk. And then I decided to use an Arduino board for this, with it, for this because it's nice and easy to use. And we've got temperature sensor, a light sensor, and a red LED. So that's what the web page looks like. I haven't spent any effort uh, styling it, as you can see. So we've got a temperature, displays the current temperature on the board. The light displays the light level. And we've got a click checkbox that enables us to switch the light on and off. So it's a bit like a, a thermostat uh, combined with a, a smart light bulb. So this is how it works. So we have uh, the Arduino board, and it's got a temperature sensor, a light sensor, and an LED. It's uh, communicating here with a Java server. And then the client, the web page, running in a browser. Um, I've configured the home router, so this page can find the home router and talk to the server. And then, so then the server's sending the temperature and light data, and it's receiving commands to switch the light on and off. So I'll give you a little bit of demo, show it working and we'll talk through the de this sort of example in, in more detail. So here we have the home server. So I'll start this up. I'm just showing it, showing it working to give you a bit of a grip on it. Okay, so, so there we go. So there's the server started up, and it's listing, and the light level is uh, sort of automatically, the range is automatically set, so it's a value between the maximum that this thing has seen and the minimum that this thing has seen. So I don't know why the light's one exactly. But uh, anyway, and this is the board here. So I think you can probably see the board. And as I put the board into the light, the light level goes up and it automatically sets its range. And then the, the light level goes down to like 0.5 or whatever. And if I make it completely dark, uh, it'd probably go right down. Yep. And then here we have the temperature sensor. So if I, again, if I put my finger on it, it'd probably go up a bit. Oh, it's pretty warm in here. Yeah, so you can see it going up there, 26, 27. So it's going up temperature. And then, so that's the, uh, that's the server, and then we've got the web page. So here we can see it's reflecting the temperature, reflecting the light. So if I put it in the light, um, it goes up to 1, and comes out of the light, goes back down to 5.5, five, and again the temperature, you know, if I go, it should go up, it's a bit, a bit laggy. Pretty eight, right, there we go. And then we've got the light switch, so if we hold it here, um, I can click on the thing here, and then it'll switch the light on. And click on the light switch checkbox here, and it'll switch the light off. Good luck. Yep, great. So that's what we're going to show you how to build. Um, and it's, uh, you know, once you've configured, so this is running locally, but if you configure your router correctly, you can control this board from anywhere in the world. So you can go to China, you know, load up this web page um, with the appropriate um, URL, which I'll explain. And then you'll be able to switch that LED off from China or switch that LED off on and off from Siberia. Wherever you can get internet access, you'll be able to um, interact, with your, um, interact with this thing. So, pretty cool. All right. Okay. So that's the demo. That's what we're going to build. And I'll just show you how it, how it all works. So here we have the home router. First, you need to configure the home router. And that's the real pain, pain you know. And the ease in which you can do this depends on the quality of your home router. And I have to say, I'm not a fan of BT, but um, the BT home router is pretty good for this stuff. And it may vary if you're using a different um, internet service provider. So we've got two problems with the home router. Uh, one problem is that all the IP addresses uh, on your local network are just local IP addresses. So your, your home router is going to dynamically allocate private IP addresses to connect to computers. Same with any local network, right? So so my, my desktop might have like 192.168.185 or 10.10.11, whatever. These addresses are only valid within your local network. If I type in that address within on a 
in China, let's say, I'm just going to reach another machine on, my local, on the local network in China. I'm not going to reach my home network. So I if I can't reach my home machine by typing this IP address into a browser at Middlesex. That's one problem. Second problem is um, the home routers do have a globally valid IP address, but that can just change you know, on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis, depending on the whims of the internet service provider. I've actually, you know, my IP address in my home router, you know, isn't stable. I have no control over it unless I pay extra money for a static one. And so, you know, this can just change all the time. Oh yeah, sorry, so I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So um, we have these local addresses within, the, um, within our local network at home. The home router does have a globally valid IP address, so I can, re I can reach my home router from the internet, even though it changes, as I'm going to talk about. And then so I can send a packet to my home router, and then that forwards that packet to the computer on the home network. So we have to configure it to forward packets for certain ports to particular computers on the home network. So this is how it works. So here's a view of the, uh, my home network. So we've got different PCs and smart devices and so on and so forth, connected to wireless or wireless. These have their local addresses, and then this home router here has a globally valid public IP address. So we send a packet to here, and I can configure this thing to forward put the packet that address to particular ports to particular computers. Yeah, so this is, this is the second problem I just started talking about, is that the address of the home router is typically allocated by the internet service provider. So it can change daily, monthly, and you don't know when it's going to change. So if you write it down today and set, it, set up everything, then your IP address might become completely invalid tomorrow. And you don't know when it's going to change. So if I want to reach a server running on my home network, I've got to somehow find out what that IP address is. And the way in which you do this is using a dynamic DNS service. So what this is is like a, it's a, it's a company, a server, website, and this website holds a record of your current IP address. So you could just email them this record, but I'll explain how it actually gets updated. So this website knows what your current IP address is, and then what you do is you register a subdomain with this company. So I've registered like dogames.ddns.net. So whenever I go, whenever someone anywhere in the world goes to dogames.ddns.net, they get redirected um, to my home to the to my home router, which then can pass that request on to my local machines on my local network. So a person who wants to reach my machine goes to this address and is redirected to my current IP address, the IP address of my current router. And this address is kept current on the Dynamic DNS website um, because there's a client on my home network that sends regular messages to the company's server. So every minute or whatever, it pings the server saying that this router has this IP address. This client can run on a home computer, or some home routers can be configured to send these messages. So you know, I said BT Home Hub is quite good in this respect because I can configure dynamic DNS here. I can just enable dynamic DNS, and then I set it up with my like, username and password or whatever. The, my re I register with the, with the website. I get a username and password, and I put that username and password into my home hub, and then the home hub pings dynamic DNS service you know, every minute or whatever it does uh, with, with my current IP address, of that, with the IP address of this router. So then, so then I can go to that IP address, I can go to that subdomain, and that will then redirect me, redirect the request sent to the subdomain um, to my home router. So that's the first step. Now um, I can find my home router from anywhere in the world um, using this dynamic DNS service. So that's great. That's the first step. The second problem is I now need to configure my home router to direct uh, requests sent to particular ports to particular machines. So I've got an incoming packet going to like 4446. How does the home router decide where that packet's going to be sent? Because it's incoming traffic. It's not response to request. It's just incoming traffic. So it needs to direct this packet to a specific port on a specific computer. And so it needs to be configured so that it knows how to do this. And this is called port forwarding. So I need to set up like a particular game or application. Um, I need to like configure this, um, like add a protocol if necessary, a range of ports and select a particular machine that handles these, requ these uh, requests that are sent on particular ports. So again, I just need to configure my home hub so that when I send a, a packet to my home hub, it forwards it to the server that's running a particular machine on that network. So once you've done all this messy stuff, it's not that hard to do, but once you've done it, 
um, then I can, this is like on my local network, 192.168.188. So this is accessing my home server um, using the local IP address, and that works. Now I've got it set up with the dynamic DNS service, uh, also running on my home network, but this time I'm going through the dynamic DNS service, and that's also working. And then I checked that it was working on my phone. My phone's not connected to Wi-Fi or anything like that, so it's coming from completely outside my network, but it's still managing to reach my home server. And so that once it's set up, it works quite nicely. Um, it's, and, you know, it's okay. It's okay in the sense that I still have to pay for the dynamic DNS service or regularly update it, uh, regularly uh, refresh my information on there, which isn't such a hardship, but it's a bit of a pain. If I was doing this commercially, I'd do it in a different way because the, the home user is not going to mess around with all this home router configuration, and it'll vary with the, with the way in which, in the way in which It'll vary with the different makes and models of router. Okay, so now I can reach my server. That's the first step. So anywhere in the world, I can type in diagrammas.dns.net, and then I can reach a particular computer um, running in my home network. So that's great. Next step is we need to interface with the things themselves. We need some way in which of talking to the LED or talking to the temperature sensor, and uh, some way in which my server can communicate with the real physical things. One way in which you could do this is uh, using a Raspberry Pi, and it's got these input pins to read temperature of light, probably output pins as well. Um, so I didn't pick this, um, partly because it's more fiddly to do on the Raspberry Pi, and partly because um, when I first taught this course, um, you know, another sort of module uh, was taught on the Raspberry Pi, so it seemed a bit of a duplication to use the Raspberry Pi on this module and another module. Could also use a gun six computer or a PIC microcontroller can do this kind of work. Um, in the end, I settle on the Arduino board, um, which is a very beautiful bit of hardware. It's really easy to write simple programs um, that do different things on this hardware, and it's, um, it's a peach. And you can buy a clone for 850, or sp I spend a bit more money to get the full kit, but you know, the simple clone that works perfectly well costs you eight pound, about eight pound 50. So there's an Arduino Uno, very nicely designed piece of hardware. And it's very nice software that um, it enables you to write programs and upload them to the hardware. So it's got this IDE. So you just write your programs in the IDE and click upload. Uploads them as long as everything's working. And you can monitor the serial port as well. And so how it works is we write the CDs, we write programs written in C, which are uploaded to the Arduino board. And then these seek programs can communicate with Java using the serial port. Um, and I'll explain how we do that. And so the first thing we need to do is build the circuit, build the hardware. And what we've got is we're using uh, digital output pin 2 to control a red LED, and then we're using the analog inputs to read the temperature and the light level. So this is the board. And so I showed you the board when I did the demo, but here it is again, just so you can see it. So we've got, um, so this is essentially the same as that. We've got the LED there. We've got a couple of resistors um, for the light and the LED. And then we've got the... Um, light sensor there, and the temperature sensor there. So very simple circuit, nothing too complicated there. And if you want to you know, do, do this, then the, the full circuit's sort of I've done a very rough circuit diagram there so you can see what's going on. And then the circuit, the code itself, is just reading the temperature and light level and sending the readings over the serial point, port using this vaguely JSON. It's not JSON, but it looks a bit like JSON. JSON-inspired format, like this kind of format here. And then it receives the commands also over the serial port to switch the LED on or off. So just briefly talking through the Arduino code, it's all available to download on the course website. So we have like a max and minimum light levels. As I said, the light is auto-ranging. It's not absolute light. It's like the one corresponds to the brightest light the thing's seen, and naught corresponds to the darkest light the thing's seen since it started. And then we've got the temperature value. I think the temperature is accurate. It is some kind of absolute temperature value. Um, and the current light level, which will be between these ranges, and then uh, it has certain, com I've defined a couple of commands, uh, like switch the light on, switch the light off. Setup's pretty simple, it runs every time the thing boots up. Um, and then we've got loop, which uh, in the loop we send the readings off on the serial port to the Java server. And we process data from the serial port to determine whether we should switch the light on or off, and then it just goes to sleep for a second wakes up and performs the loop again. So processing serial data is pretty easy. It's reading data from the serial port. And if it, this data corresponds to a light off message, 
it writes, it switches the pin low, switches the LED off. If the, if, if the reads a light on message, then it switches the pin into its high state, which switches the LED on. Sensor readings, uh, it just reads the temperature, reads the light, updates the variables, and then builds this string that looks a little bit like JSON, but isn't really, um, which um, contains both the temperature and the light level and sends that off over the serial port where it can be read by the Java. The reading temperature, we're just getting analog read of the value on the A0 pin and then doing a bit of fiddling to convert it into the temperature value. And reading light, um, again, we're just reading the analog value, the value on the analog input pin. And we're doing this auto-ranging stuff, that's what that's doing there. And then just setting the light value with a bit of fiddling around. And so this is what's, what it's outputting over the serial port, like the temperature equals that and the light equals that. That's what's being sent up to the Java server. And here we come to the Java server. So we talked about the Java HTTP server class in the uh, media streaming talk. So I like this because it's a way in which you can build a standalone server um, that's very flexible and can handle HTTP requests um, without the sort of messing about of configuring a servlet. So with um, Glassfish and Apache, you have to configure a servlet or some other bit of, some other endpoint or some other way in which the server, way in which say Apache, can redirect HTTP requests to a particular part of the code. And this is a sort of lighter and easier way of building a HTTP server in Java. Obviously, it's not cool. you've got to implement the stuff that Apache implements already, but for very simple, small product projects, I think this is much easier to use. As I also explained, we have, um, so how the HTTP server works is you have what's called a context. So you have like part of the URL, is directed to particular Java classes which handle those requests. So home monitor, I have a home HTTP handler, sensor has a sensor HTTP handler, and light has a light HTTP handler. And this server communicates with the Arduino using the serial port. So this is the server bit of it. So we've got an Arduino interface, and that's just a wrapper that receives the, Ardu the, the data that's sent over the serial port, the sensor data, and sends the light on or light off messages. And so that's our Arduino interface. And then we have like a usual host address, whatever. We create the HTTP server here. And we have a handlers for these three different contexts. These are separate Java classes that um, handle HTTP requests sent to home monitor or sent to sensor or sent to light switch. So this is the sort of architecture. We've got a home server. And then there's three separate handlers for three different types of requests. And these are all talking to the Arduino interface, which is uh, sending and receiving data to and from the Arduino using the serial port. So the serial com communication is, uh, so the communication of the Arduino is through the uh, serial port. It's typically COM3 in Windows, but it depends how many boards you've got running and how the thing's all set up. To talk, for Java to talk to the serial port, you need a third party library. And the one I found that works nicely is this NR Java serial. So some libraries, other third party libraries, are a bit messy, you have to have DLLs and all this kind of stuff. NR Java Serial just works out of the box. You don't need to add anything else to your project. I've included it in the course website, and you can also download it from there. So I recommend NR Java Serial for this. Then we have the Arduino interface, just a Java class that uses NR Serial to read temperature and light sensor data from the serial port, and it stores a local copy so that the other classes can access it easily, and then it sends the commands to the Arduino to switch the LED on or off. And then we have the, the three HTTP handlers which are associated with particular context. So whenever you send a HTTP request to uh, a URL that ends with um, a slash sensor, it gets directed to this class. And this class outputs the temperature or light level depending on the URL query parameter. So if you send, a, so if you, if you contact the sensor with a question mark, with the query parameter being question mark, like with light at the end of it, um, then it'll send the light reading. And if you use temperature, as the end of the URL query parameter, then you get the light reading. So this is the code in the sensor HTTP handler. We've got like query string gets the full like URL, and then if it, the query string, sorry, the query string is just the bit at the end here, the bit after the question mark. And so if the query string equals temperature, then it replies, it, it gets the temperature from the Arduino wrapper and sends that out as the response. Otherwise, if it's light, it again gets the, gets the light from the Arduino wrapper and writes that out as a response. Otherwise, it sends some kind of error. So if we use this URL, with, with the, this is the, the context. This is the query string here. Then we get like 20.31. So I can actually show you this working. 
Um, so in this case, this is the is the server running? Nope, server's not running. So let's let's run the server again. So this is started and it's talking to the Arduino board. Now in this case we've got the home monitor which is pulling the date, which is like the um, let's just copy that URL. Now if we go to the instead of go that's the that's the that's pointing to the home monitor context or whatever it's called. But let's go to the sensor context. So we go sensor. So in this case, we've got no query string. So with a bit of luck, it'll give it an error. And then um, if we go light, um, we're getting the current light level. And if I cover it up and refresh it, it gets naught. And if we refresh it again, it gets, gets more light. And if we go to temperature, get temperature, and it gives the current temperature. And if we refresh it and I keep it warm, Come on. Yeah, it gets, it gets warmer, right? So now I'm talking directly to the handler um, that's handling the temperature, the light level, and by changing the, the query uh, query string, I'm, I'm determining which data I'm pulling out of the sensor. And what all this page is doing, it's doing exactly the same. This is just using HTTP requests XML HTTP request to talk to this sensor context and pull out the appropriate data. Okay, so that's uh, that's the sensor handler, and then we got the light HTTP handler, and this is just doing the same thing except um, in this case the query string is a one if you want to switch the light on, or a naught if you want to switch the light off. So if the query string equals naught in this case. Um, it's switching the light off, or otherwise it's switching the light on. And that's about it on the, on the light HTTP handler. Uh, now, what is the light HTTP handler? So again, I can, show you, I can show you this working. So this is the, so that's the sensor. That's the home monitor. <sighs> Trying to work out the context for the light handler. You must tell me here. Oh, it'll tell me in the code actually. On, I can I can get it out of here. Yeah, light switch. Okay. So. If we go in here, instead of going to home monitor, we go to light switch and query one. So currently um, it's off. You can see the light switch off, but if I go here, light switch one, and we switch it on. And if I change the query to naught, um, then with a bit of luck, that switches the light off, yeah. I mean, it's not like returning anything because probably it's, it's just it's a put request or whatever. It switches it on. We change the query string to naught and switch it off. So that's talking directly to the uh, handler for the light switch. And as I said, this is this page is just a JavaScript that does that um, does that does the communication with the um, with those handlers. Okay, so that's the light HTTP handler, which is like light switch is the context. We registered with that, and then we got the home monitor, the home HTTP handler, and what this does is it loads up this index file and echoes it back to the user because otherwise we're going to get we're using JavaScript to talk to the other context, so we need to serve up the JavaScript from this particular server. Otherwise, we're going to get this cross-origin uh, request failure because of the security thing. Um, so we need to serve up. So this is serving up just a simple index file. Index file has the that's showing you the that's the HTML. That's like the front end displaying the temperature and the light, and the light switch, the stuff that I showed you, you know, originally. So that's that HTML is just doing this stuff, and then we got the JavaScript. And what the JavaScript is send, is doing is it's sending HTT, XML HTTP requests to the light switch. So depending on whether you click the, um, the checkbox, it's sending a 
like a, a naught with naught at the end with a query parameter to naught or query parameter one, which is just what, what I just showed you. Or, and then every so often it's calling, it's doing a, updating the temperature, and it's sending a get temperature request or get, um, or get, um, get temperature. I think there's one that updates the, the light level as well. And that's what's generating this web page here, a combination of the HTML and the JavaScript. Okay, well, I think I've given you enough, enough demos of that. So um, the example website, it's Java Studio Library. So everything's on the course website that you need to be able to set up this example, run it at home. Obviously, you're going to have to get hold of an Arduino and a few bits and bobs, electronic bits and bobs, which is pretty easy. There's a couple of books on this. As usual, you know, I, I found the resources that I put on the course website more helpful than these books, but they might be useful if you're interested. And there's a section on the in the distributed and cloud computing book on this stuff. Okay, so just to wrap it up. Um, so this lecture, I've given you general introduction to the Internet of Things, talked about some of the protocols used by Nest, um, and explained how you can actually um, build, use this kind of technology yourself, put together your own projects using a combination of Java, Java HTTP server, and the Arduino. And that's it. No more lectures in this course.